Welcome in all you lovely Hurley Burleyites, which leads me to think if podcasts had a virtual welcome mat, ours would say, take off your boots, goddammit, it's mucky enough in here already. So happy to have you here for another two-part Hurley Burley podcast. For part one, we have the leader of the Liberal Party of Ontario, Stephen Del Duca. We're going to talk to Stephen a little bit about his life, learn more about him, where he wants to take Ontario, the issues and policies he's going to run on, what he means by restoring dignity as an overarching umbrella for his policy process and thinking. Part two of the podcast is our weekly political panel, Scott Reed and Jenny Byrne. They're fun, they're feisty, and like a moderately well-tended ficus plant, they're evergreen and hard to kill. We're going to talk about the Julie Payette fireworks late last week, and we'll share our own stories of working with GGs, as long as they aren't boring. Getting the vaccine into Canada, getting the vaccine distributed, getting the vaccine into arms. Has the political response to vaccine issues been tough enough or not tough enough? We'll also think forward to all parties possibly being in spring election mode and how the writ period and possible transfer of government might impact communications and decisions that need to be made in the vaccine rollout. Plus, we'll each throw our hey yous out into the nether regions of the internet and see if anybody takes the bait. Stephen Del Duca, I want to welcome you to the Hurley Burley. We've known each other for a long time, but it is really great to have you here. Thanks for coming on. It's my pleasure, David. Thank you so much for having me on. Looking forward to it. Yeah, it'll be fun. It'll be fun. So how are you? I ask everybody and I want to know about you. We're almost a year bloody into this thing now. Yeah, I mean, I'm doing fine. I mean, honestly, here at home, we have no no complaints. Everyone is healthy, thank goodness. Uh, my parents, my mother-in-law and father-in-law, everyone's good. I think my daughters are a little bit tired of uh, the virtual learning. I think at some point soon, I think they'd like to see their friends again. Uh, but on balance- How old are they? Uh, my older daughter is in grade eight, so 13 and soon to be 10. Our younger daughter turns 10 in April. Right. How's the homeschooling been going? Uh, you know, I think, I think. look, we're lucky. We have the devices. We have a decent internet connection. Um, you know, uh, both obviously, both my wife and I are here around the house. And uh, so that helps. But it's not ideal. And I can't even begin to imagine what it must be like for um, the thousands of students and families where there are financial challenges, where they don't have the same privilege that we do. Um, it must be really, really tough. I think, I think this is going to be a year um, that we're going to spend a lot of time collectively trying to catch up from as it relates to publicly funded education. How are your kids doing generally being locked up all this time away from their friends and stuff? <clears throat> you know, I think, again, it's not easy. Um, I've, I've noticed this uh, this version now that we're in winter, this version of the lockdown, they've got a little bit more cabin fever than they did last spring. Uh, not as easy to coax them to go outside. Um, you know, we have two dogs. And so uh, so it can get a little bit rowdy in the house. In fact, at some point, because I'm leading the Ontario Liberal Party from my dining room table, at some point you may hear uh, one or both dogs <laughs> in the background. Uh, they don't uh, they don't they don't really respect when I'm when I'm on different broadcasts. <laughs> Um, so they've got the dogs, so that's, you know, so they do go outside. It's just, I've noticed this time around a little bit more cabin fever. Uh, and I think that's partially because of the weather and partially because they're tired. We're all tired. Everybody's tired of this. Yeah, for sure. The last time I saw you was the day you were elected. Um, <laughs> right. And, uh, which is pretty much the weekend before the world closed down. Yeah. Like I'm still. I, by the way, I'm still amazed that wasn't some sort of super spreader event. That convention. Yeah, uh, I'm still lucky. amazed that. Yeah, still amazed that we gathered in those numbers at that time. Um, in retrospect, but in any event, so it's been a year, and it's been the weirdest year you could uh, imagine for you. Um, how do you feel about what you've been able to do in a year in the job? I think to me the the most amazing thing is the I'll say the resilience of Ontario Liberal Party members. They. Uh, look, we were all shocked in that first month with uh, the first lockdown, uh, the disruptions that we're still living with. Ontario Liberal Party members transitioned fairly quickly and really well to all of the virtual platforms that we use. Um, so riding associations continued to meet. Uh, we were able to do regional consultations, uh, again, using virtual platforms. And there were some major decisions that the party made between, let's say, the middle to end of March and July the 1st. Uh, radically transforming our party. For example, we now have free membership, first time in our party's history provincially, only major political party provincially that has no cost barrier to enter the party. Uh, we were able to do all of that consultative work and get that passed by executive council 
ratified by provincial council all within a couple of months. So I'm, I've been really struck by how well party members have done, um, but it is not the easiest thing to do when you've been touring pretty relentlessly for 12 plus months in search of winning the leadership um, with a plan to go back out on the road and keep touring to introduce myself to Ontarians to earn their trust uh, and to find that come to a pretty hard stop because of the lockdown has been tough, has been tough. Politics is all about connecting with people. Yeah. How do you, how do you, and, and you're kind of a tactile guy uh, politically. How do you, how do you connect with people? Uh, in it's not world? easy. You know, I'll tell you something. When over the summer months, when the numbers of COVID dropped across the province, I did go back out on the road when we felt it was safe to do so. But even that touring um, was, you know, there was physical distancing. We were all masked. Nobody obviously shook hands. It's really tough in, in our business. Uh, to do that kind of politics when you have to adhere to all of those guidelines, all of those rules. And I'll say it's really tough for me because you're right. I do like being in the midst of an audience. I like feeding off of the audience and feeling that energy. And so it's, it's been a real, uh, it's been a real learning experience for me as well. Yeah. 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 So let's get into your, let's get into what makes you tick in politics. What got you into politics? What's the, <laughs> You know, like me, I believe you got involved as a young person. That makes mm -hmm. us both weird, makes us both mutants. Yep. We were interested in it at a time when nobody was interested in it. Why were you interested? In it? So in the, um, so Christmas 1987, I was 14. And my older sister, uh, her gift to me Christmas that year was um, Keith Davies' book, The Rainmaker. And oh, yeah. uh, I think that she had seen in me, even at that point, um, as you put it, a very unusual interest in uh, in politics, <laughs> and government, and Canadian history. And instead of doing her very best to uh, you know to cure me of that, she actually kind of lit the fire by getting me Senator Davies' book. Uh, I believe I still have a copy of that book somewhere in this house. I've read it hundreds, if not thousands, of times. I was I was really blown away by how um, how that in, you know how that book explained the life of being politically active could be, what you could get done, and just there was just something that spoke to me in that book. Only a few months later, um, another family friend, uh, sorry, another relative invited me um, to come to a meeting. Now, I didn't know what the meeting was all about. My parents didn't know. They said, Stephen, if you wanna go, go. So I went to the meeting. It turned out to be a federal nomination meeting in 1988 in the writing of Eglinton Lawrence, uh, where there was uh, a newcomer who we all know, uh, who was uh, aspiring to become an MP. And he was taking on a sitting Liberal MP in that nomination. And there were, um, there were thousands of people, from what I recall, at the old Regal Constellation Hotel out by the airport. It's not there anymore. And uh, I was just, there were national media there. There were spotlights. It was crazy. And look, in that first instance, what my, what my, what my cousin was looking for was unskilled labor. Had me and a bunch of other young guys there putting out chairs and tables and holding up signs. But from that nomination meeting in the spring of 1988 through to the federal campaign that was in the fall, uh, the great free trade election campaign of 1988, I went back to that riding, I knocked on doors, I fell in love. I fell in love with politics and it's 32, this will be 33 years later, and here I am. And uh, it's been quite a journey. And there's a lot of great things that I've experienced because of this journey. A lot of challenges too, but a lot of really great things. Well, we like to recommend books on this podcast. so. Tell, tell, tell the listeners what's great about The Rainmaker by Keith Davey. You know, I found, uh, I just found that like there were things in there where he he had lists of, you know, um, like I yeah, forget the phrasing now, but like top 10 things you need to do to have a proper, a proper election campaign, what separates or differentiates liberals from uh, conservatives and NDPers. He didn't pull any punches. Uh, just the stories of what he was able to do as his time as national director, campaign director under former prime ministers, Pearson Trudeau. Um, you know, the fact that he got to the Senate, I think when he was 38 or 39 years old, it was just very fascinating to me. And from what I recall in that book, there was also, although I didn't fully grasp it at 14 years of age, there was also, um, you know, there was a funny side to it. There was a sense of humor there. There was a whimsy in that book, the way that uh, former Senator uh, Davey wrote it and lived it, uh, that just really struck me as pretty relatable and pretty cool, as funny as that sounds. I've always been wondering why he got appointed to the Senate after winning a minority government. You know, I co-chaired a campaign that won a minority <laughs> government. 
I didn't get called to the Senate. I didn't even get a whisper. I didn't get anything. <laughs> <laughs> this is not about you, David. It's not about you. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> um, would you say you have political heroes? You know, yes, I would. I would actually, um, you know, kind of sort of jumping off or segueing off that uh, the book, The Rainmaker. Um, I love reading. I do a lot of reading um, here in this house. There are probably hundreds of books. I think my poor wife can't understand how I can continue to purchase and read books about the same person over and over and over again. Uh, I love biographies. I love political biographies. And in particular, I love American presidential biographies. And so most of my book collection uh, centers around that. So yeah, I do have some heroes. Uh, FDR, um, you know, and uh, is one that stands out for me in particular. Lincoln, obviously. Um, but yeah, there, you know, there, and there are, and there are others. By the way, your dog has made an appearance. Charming. Yeah, that's Hunter. That's yeah. our Australian Shepherd. He's in the backyard right now. Barking. <laughs> yeah. Two-year-old Australian. Somebody's... Lots of energy. Lots of energy. Yeah, they, that dog needs to run right now. Yeah. 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 Um, okay, so Ford, yeah. Premier Ford, is just a little over halfway through his term. Much of it's been dominated by COVID, an issue he couldn't have or nobody could have anticipated would happen. So really, as we head into the next, as we head into the stretch run for the next election, what's the argument against Ford's re-election? What's the core reason Ford shouldn't be reelected? Yeah, I think, look, I think the core reason is that his um, his values are not consistent with Ontario's values. I think that um, while I will be the first to admit that his tone uh, improved as the pandemic hit all of us, um, that he dem has demonstrated, still does, um, a kind of folksy empathy for the people of Ontario, which has obviously given people in this province a, a a chance to take a second look at him versus where he was in the first 16 or 17 months as being premier. I think most Ontarians who are pragmatic, uh, who, you know, don't believe in extremes, um, I think they recognize that the tone has changed and the empathy has gotten better, but he hasn't backed that up with any real meaningful, competent action. And I think it shows. I think it shows particularly during the second wave and I think when we get to the other side of this pandemic, which we all, of course, hope is sooner rather than later, and the people of the province are contemplating who they want to take us through the rebuild, and I mean the rebuild across the board, not just economically, I, I think they will be looking for, uh, they'll be looking for someone who's got competence. Uh, I, think they, I think there's an understanding right now that it turns out, shockingly, that experience matters. And when he came to the job in 2018, he didn't have it and his cabinet didn't have it, and his caucus for the most part didn't have it. And I think that's been a struggle for them. And I think people have paid for that, us, people of Ontario have paid for that. And so I think that's the biggest argument against him. When you say his values are inconsistent with the values of Ontario, what are you referring to? I, you know, I think Doug Ford came to the job believing that um, it's easier than it looks. I think he came to the job believing that it was perfectly fine to look out for your buddies. Um, I think he came to the job believing that the best way to create a prosperous and growing economy is to fall back on all of those really feel-good ideas of slashing red tape. I'm putting this in quotes, slashing red tape and unleashing the power of the private sector and uh, everything else will take care of its, you know, take care of itself. Uh, I think there are a lot of things that he's embraced, both in style and in content. Uh, that seem to me to be focused mostly on turning millionaires into billionaires. And I don't think that's what we need right now. And I don't think Ontarians want that right now. I'm all for wealth creation. I'm all for prosperity and economic growth. But that's only half of the story. And it's, uh, you know, look, we left office in 2018, David, and all of the macroeconomic indicators were good. Um, um, but left, office is a, left office is a friendly euphemism, I would say. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> you're correct. You're correct. Hey, it's still a but, but, you know, all of the macro indicators were strong. But you know, what yeah. you know, talking about those macro indicators, if your own if your own household is suffering, you know, I'm knocking on a door in my home running of Woodbridge, and someone is relying on the local food bank, and I tell them that our GDP is great. Well, you know, how, how does that work for them? And so, anyway, I think right. Doug. I think Doug's got the wrong end of the stick on this. I think it shows. I think people see it. And I think that's ultimately 
how he will be judged. Well, they, they I mean, they ate him up like Pooh Bear, Pooh Bear eats honey in the election campaign. What do you think they're getting, voters, Ontarians, are getting from Ford that they didn't bargain for when they voted for him? You mean at this stage or initially in those first 16 or 17 months? Well, let's say, I mean, the whole, the whole record overall. Overall. I, you know, I think, I think back to that 2018 campaign, and I don't think that, I don't think it was, it was an overwhelming embrace only of Doug Ford. I mean, don't get me wrong. There were certain segments of the population that were very happy Doug was running, for sure. The so-called Ford Nation um, diehards. I get that. I think people were looking for change. They were thirsting for change. We'd been there for 15 years. Um, so I think things were stacked against us, if I can be, you know, and I, again, I think I'm being I'm gentle when I say it that way. Um, and I think, I think Doug tapped into a sense that um, we were taking the province astray and that the fix would be easy. And uh, he found two or three or four really compelling almost slogans or, or, you know, concepts that were very relatable and very retail focused. And I think in those moments, people were, were willing to embrace simplicity and, you know, willing to embrace those slogans. I can't fault the voters at all. Um, and so he rode, he rode that to office along with the time for change concept. What I think people have gotten from him is a real mixed bag. Um, but on balance, I don't believe, and I'm talking about separate from COVID. So let's be fair to Doug and take COVID out of the equation. I don't think people in Ontario on balance believe their lives have gotten better because of Doug Ford's leadership, unless you happen to be one of his friends, unless you happen to be wealthy, unless you happen to truly not need government to be on your side, because that's who he's fighting for. Right. It's interesting. So the last poll I saw said Conservatives 34, Liberals 29, NDP 24, maybe 25. Can't remember. One of those two numbers. Why weren't, like, okay, so we were decimated. 20% of the vote, but only eight seats. Um, and, uh, you know, very marginal presence in the legislature. And then really for the last year and a half, because of COVID, very little presence at all. And yet you and the Liberals have supplanted the NDP as the alternative to the Conservatives. What is going on there? And what is wrong with the NDP that they can't close the sale with people? I mean, obviously, a lot of people who supported them in the last election have drifted away from them and back to back to the Liberals. Why is that? Well, listen, I think <clears throat> I've, I've learned uh, based on advice from from lots of friends in our business over the years. Um, I've learned to try my best not to live and die by what we see in the month to month, quarter to quarter polling, because I think especially right now in, in this time of COVID, all of that research is quite scrambled and all over the place. Um, I'm aware, obviously, of the poll you're talking about, but there were polls two, three months ago that had the numbers for Doug, Doug Ford much higher and from you know me and the Liberals in third place. So I think it is all over the place. Um, having said that, I, look, I think there is inherent resilience in the liberal brand here in this province. Um, I think people attach a sense to the liberal brand of, of that, you know, that pragmatism, uh, that middle of the road, moderate, um, avoiding extremes, um, investing in critically important things like education, healthcare, clean environment, strong economy, all of those touchstones for us as liberals. And I think it's, it's comfortable for a good chunk of Ontario to um, to lean towards wanting to be considered liberal. Having said that, that same poll shows most Ontarians don't know who I am. And we as, uh, as a party, me as a leader, we have a ton of work still to do. And earning the trust of the voters of this province will not come easily, will not happen by default. And uh, I'm very aware of that. As for the NDP, I, I don't know for sure what it is. Um, I think that... I think what I've seen through the pandemic uh, and even prior to is that Andrea Horvath and that caucus seem to be, they seem to be fighting to maintain what they have. They seem to be more focused on preserving their place in the legislature and less focused on, you know, what's the best plan forward for Ontario. It's like they're auditioning for the job they already have. And I think voters, even though they're busy, even though they're very disrupted because of COVID, I think they see that and they feel that. 
Um, so I, you know, I don't know how, what Andrea and her team will do over the next number of months to try to be prepared for an election campaign, not underestimating her or them at all. Uh, but I think that's the biggest problem for them. Well, well, you're in a different position than them, right? Because you're probably going to draw, if you were to grow and form government, you're going to have drawn some from the conservatives and some from the new Democrats in order to do that. Yeah. Their path to government lies in destroying you and the Liberal Party. Um, that shows so too. that's pre that's presumably their imperative over the course of the next year. What do you think they'll do? So, well, look, I think you're right, and I think that goes to the point I I, I mentioned a second ago. They're they're in a fight to preserve. They're in a fight for the status quo, and look, that shows. If you look at the way that um, they've handled their criticisms of Doug Ford through the pandemic, there's almost always the inclusion of a shot at the Ontario Liberal Party and Stephen Del Duca. And look, I'm a big boy. I have sharp elbows. I understand the cut and thrust of politics. Um, I think they're going to continue to try to play it that way throughout. And I think that's, I, you know, I don't think voters are going to embrace that. Um, I, I can recognize when Andrea's got a good idea. I recognize when Mike Schreiner's got a good idea. I'll even tell you if I think Doug Ford's done something right. Um, I just don't, I don't think Andrea ha and her team on balance, I just don't think have that level of that level of openness in them at this moment, and I think it will turn off voters, especially coming out of a crisis like COVID. Interesting, um, Mr. Del Duca. We have to take a quick break for a word from our presenting sponsor, Telus, and we will be right back. Last week on this pod, our guest Francis Donald talked about the important knockdown economic effects of investing in and building infrastructure. Sometimes we tend to think of that word, infrastructure, as a broad construct, and it becomes almost an abstraction to us. It's anything but. Infrastructure means real projects, real jobs, education, and improvements in communities all across this country. Listen to how our presenting sponsor, TELUS, brought high-speed internet to Quebec's remote Lower North Shore, and what that meant to the Indigenous women of Pakwashipu. Barely 10 years ago, women in the village would rarely dare to speak publicly or voice their opinion. Now they're leaders in digital change and drivers of economic redevelopment. After TELUS brought high-speed internet to the area in 2019, the women created videos and animations, language courses, and artisanal, artisanal crafting workshops. Oral traditions and crafts, slowly passed down generation to generation, are now immediately exported across borders to the rest of the world. Not only does it generate revenue for Pakwashipu, it's cultural preservation. High-speed connectivity is also the gateway for further education. Remote management training workshops and virtual education programs lead directly to jobs without ever having to leave the village to pursue schooling. This kind of work, bringing high-speed internet to rural and remote communities, is so important for TELUS. They believe all Canadians should be able to digitally access every opportunity through a world-class network. But the reality is, it's almost two and a half times more expensive, on average, to connect people in rural communities. So TELUS needs the continuing support of all levels of government to make these builds as economically viable as possible. Go to connectingcanadaforgood.ca to learn more. Okay, we're going to talk some policy now uh, that we're back with you. So let's start with COVID, as little fun as it is to talk about. <clears throat> what would you have, and it's all hindsight, listen, let's all grant the provincial government the fact that in March nobody knew what the hell was happening and uh, nobody could really have been expected to be ready. But looking back on a year of it now, what would you have done differently than the Ford government has done with respect to COVID? So I just, I, I know you said it, I just want to repeat it. I think you're right. It is all hindsight uh, for the most part. Although if you trace through 10 or 11 months of what I and our party has been saying, you'll see that at various points, we've been saying this throughout. Uh, I think from the very beginning, it was really clear that there was no real plan um, to prepare for all of the widespread testing for COVID that we needed and the infrastructure that was required for that. Um, I think the testing and the contact tracing kind of go hand in hand when you look at the places in the world that have done the best in fighting COVID. Those were, those were sort of two pillars that were required from the very beginning. Um, I think a couple of other things I already mentioned, or I, I talk about it all the time, long-term care. And I say this, and I've said this in every interview that I've done, I acknowledge it's a problem that's existed now for many years. This is not a shot exclusively mm -hmm. 
at Doug Ford and the conservatives in any way, shape or form. But we're now almost a year into this pandemic and it's still a mess and it's still tragic and people are still losing their lives. And um, I don't, again, see any meaningful action happening there. Um, I was a big believer over the summer and I still am that the plan that they put forward to reopen our schools in September was totally half-baked. It's like they didn't want to make the effort or make the investment required to cap class sizes. Uh, even things like school bus transportation weren't thought of properly. Uh, the mental health challenges, special needs kids. I mean, there was so much there um, that through May, June, July, and August, Doug Ford could have focused on, chose not to. Um, and the list kind of goes on from there, right up until the vaccine rollout. The decision to pause the vaccine rollout over the Christmas holidays, I think, baffled me. It certainly baffled, I think, lots of Ontarians. But the central thing that I think has really kind of been shown by Doug Ford throughout the pandemic is that he and his government and therefore our province always seems to be delayed and lag behind um, what other provinces are doing um, and what a lot of people with expertise are calling on them to do. <clears throat> so even if it's the decision to wait several days before introducing tougher lockdown measures, um, you know, rent relief for both residential um, and commercial uh, uh, tenants, um, issues on long-term care, like I referenced a second ago, it's like they're always sort of a, as the old saying goes, always kind of a day late and a dollar short. And I just don't get that 10 or 11 months into this pandemic. And that's not about hindsight. It's still happening right now with paid sick days. Everybody's calling on Doug Ford. Forget opposition politicians, everybody, mayors, public health leaders, everyone, paid sick days. You need it. You got to get, Tories are saying it, you know, when I think of the mayors. Nope, not going to do it. Not going to do it. Stubborn, callous, just not going to do it. It's crazy. So here's what I don't understand about some of these things, which is it is tempting if you're in an Ontario vacuum to look at, say, an issue like long-term care and say, well, this is the results of a callous right-wing government that doesn't care about people and lets private sector companies do what they want to do. Except that... There's two things that trouble me about this. One of which is, you know, we had the thing and we had the the outbreak in the spring and then we had the relief of the summer and then we had the second wave that everybody is. Any competent government would have been sitting back and saying, holy God, we survived that first wave. We are so lucky politically to survive that first wave. What are we going to do to survive wave two? And you'd be sitting down, you'd be talking about what are our pressure points, schools, long-term care homes, et cetera. What do we do so that we don't get killed politically yeah. over that? And they are now starting to get killed politically over that. Approval ratings are dropping. But my question is, BC under Horgan is no better. Quebec under Legault is, is no better. Uh, nobody's any better at, say, long-term care. So as tempting as it is for me to say it's an ideological issue, it feels more like a governmental issue. Like what the hell is the problem with doing something reasonable about long-term care, whether you're Premier Oregon or Premier Ford or Premier Legault? Yeah, so listen, I, I, don't, I won't dispute that the, the situation in other provinces led by premiers representing different political parties is, uh, is dire, like it is here in Ontario. But, you know, and that's being put to me in the past because I've, I've heard Doug Ford um, you know, say many times how Ontario is effectively no worse off than other parts of Canada. But I live here in Ontario and I'm raising my family in Ontario and my parents are seniors and my in-laws are seniors here in Ontario. And so though I love my country and, you know, I don't want to see anybody in this country suffer, uh, my job is to try to put Ontario into the best position possible. It's why I'm running to be premier. And I I'm also really proud of the fact historically that Ontario has led, and I don't feel like we're leading on this issue, and we could be. So to your point, your broader point about long-term care, I think there's a lot of ageism. I think there's a lot of age discrimination. And frankly, when you look at the women and men, and it is mostly women who work in long-term care, I think that because it's women, because a large chunk of that, that working population, they're people of color, uh, they have not been paid well historically, I think it's out of sight, out of mind, and it's easy. It's far too easy for governments, regardless of partisan stripe, to just kind of push the problem into the margins and into the shadows and not be prepared to tackle it. And that's brutal and it's wrong. And it's wrong whether it's a liberal or it's a conservative or it's an NDPer. It's just wrong across the board. Having said all of that, 
there is still no excuse for Doug Ford's inaction when, when the solution to make it better even during the pandemic was apparent. His own commission has given recommendations. He's heard things from people on the front lines. Like it's so clear what could have been done. Imagine that Canadian Armed Forces report came out in May of last year. And here we are now almost in February of the following year. And aside from the right platitudes from Doug Ford in that moment back in May, nothing else has materialized. Nothing. Uh, so Ford resigns tomorrow. And the lieutenant governor calls on you to form a government. What are the first things you do with respect to long-term care? So I think like number one, right off the bat, I think we um, there needs to be a compensation or wage increase for uh, the women and men working on the front lines. Uh, there needs to be an immediate effort to start staffing up. Um, I think the working conditions combined with the wages that those women and men get paid um, have been a deterrent for people who might wanna consider becoming a personal support worker or working in other capacities in those homes. And by the way, because you referenced other provinces earlier, um, recruitment efforts around staffing started in I believe British Columbia and Quebec way back last summer. And I, from what I've seen, the media reports I've seen, they've had some success in staffing up here in Ontario to my point about the delays and being a laggard. Now, we haven't seen the same kind of effort materialize and therefore the staffing issues are still a major problem. I think the standards of care, the hours of care, uh, I think that's critically important. And I would also say, I think we do need to have a really a really important conversation about the private versus public or not-for-profit uh, model. Um, because I think that's, um, while I'm not a believer in simple solutions to every major complex problem, and I don't want to oversimplify, I do think there is there is an issue we should probably take a look at as a province in that. What would be an argument for keeping for-profit long-term care? I mean, I think the I think there's you know a twofold argument that you could you could um, you could use. Number one is what kind of contractual arrangements exist or licensing arrangements exist today, and untangling those, how difficult or costly would that be? I suspect I suspect they would be both difficult and costly. And frankly, instead of instead of spending money to get out of those contracts or licenses, I would rather invest that money in the system that we have right now. So that's number one. Um, of course, that doesn't prevent someone from saying no future contracts or licenses would be let to the private sector. Maybe that's a way right. of you know, phasing out the private the private homes, maybe. Um, I think the other argument would be that we have a capacity issue in the system right now. We don't have enough beds. We don't have enough staff. And so by trying to remove an entire chunk, and I think the largest chunk of the sector in the middle of a crisis <clears throat> um, could actually create even more disruption. And we don't need that right now. Yeah, my concern about giving them more money, Stephen, would be that in during the pandemic, when they got public money, they didn't improve service. They distributed it to their shareholders. Yeah, it's a horrible problem. That's why I think we have to have the conversation. Um, and I think it's it's got to be a conversation that goes beyond just the pandemic, but we've got to deal with it in the pandemic right now. So, for example, if I'm not mistaken, the wage increase that's been promised to personal support workers in those homes, some of whom haven't gotten it yet, as far as I know, even though Ford has been promising it for quite some time, I'm not mistaken, that's supposed to expire in March of this year. I could be wrong about that. I don't know if it's changed, but regardless, why is it expiring? Is is the issue in long-term care suddenly going to be fine in April if it's expiring in March? Right. Of course not. That compensation, that wage increase, that shouldn't be temporary. That should be permanent. That shouldn't even be a discussion point at this point in, in dealing with the crisis, but it is for him, for Doug Ford, not for me. What's... What's a, a non-COVID policy area where you really disagree with Ford? Isolate a big disagreement between you and Ford on something other than COVID. I, I don't think Doug Ford and his team value publicly funded education at all. I don't. I don't. I don't know what it's. I don't know what's there. I don't know why that's the case. They don't get it. They don't understand that it's not. It's not just education policy. It's not just social policy, though. It's both of those things. It's fundamentally economic policy. I think all of the disruption and churn we saw in the system prior to COVID is evidence of that. I think the way that they uh, continue to disrespect people who work on the front lines in education is evidence of that. And I think that's what's, that, that is what poisoned their lack of effort and interest in developing a real plan to reopen schools safely last fall. And that, like, that's just, it's unconscionable to me um, that you wouldn't recognize that when you're a premier in our province, when you're a premier in our system, one of your most profoundly important responsibilities 
is publicly funded education. And that includes post-secondary skills training, lifelong learning, as far as I'm concerned. And Doug Ford just doesn't get it. And I don't think he ever will. Well, <laughs> it's hard to know the value of education. Um, when huh. you, anyway, I'll just stop. Uh, <laughs> um, let's talk going forward a little bit. Sure. You have uh, announced a platform development process. Um, and uh, you did uh, some, a round of interviews, I guess. I think I read Martin Wright Kahn, right. where, you, where you talked about, you know, obviously the policies are going to be developed through this platform process, but the overarching theme of it is dignity. What do you mean by that? <clears throat> Look, and this was a really important, I guess, pillar of uh, what I said during the leadership campaign as well. I think that we have, and we talked about this earlier in today's interview, I think we've, we've always done well in this province to focus on those macroeconomic indicators, economic growth, unemployment, um, GDP, all of, you know, net debt to GDP ratio. We, and I'm, as I'm saying the words, my eyes are kind of glazing over because, and look, look I don't want to disrespect, or disrespect how important those indicators are. So I think we've demonstrated we know how to create prosperity as a province and economic growth. I just think that, you know, and I say this, pri I said this prior to the pandemic, but I think it's even more apparent during the pandemic. I think the other half of that coin, the other half of the prosperity coin has to be dignity. When we create wealth, when we have growth, when those macro indicators are strong, we got to make sure that what we're creating is more broadly and fairly shared. Um, I did a radio interview the other day, and uh, the the host was coming at me pretty hard on the, you want to give dignity to people. What what are you taking away from other people? And I, I you know, it was a radio interview, and I just said to, I don't. Why, why do we start the conversation off from a position of conflict? I don't feel that there's a conflict there, and why does it have to be we're taken away from? Where, you know, the notion of we're taking away from someone to make sure that people who are working hard are not falling further and further behind. Uh, and to me, it's actually a pretty fundamental Ontario concept. It's what my parents signed up for when they arrived in this country, you know, half a century ago. Come, work, be tenacious, play by the rules, do what you need to do. And in exchange for that, you're going to have opportunity. You're going to be able to find a, a, a job if you want. And if you get that job, you're going to have some kind of workplace benefit. You're going to have some kind of net beneath you. If you're, you know, you got kids and they're going to a school, that school is going to be properly funded. If you need health care, it's going to be relatively close to home, accessible and easy to navigate. And, you know, your air is going to be clean and your water is going to be clean. And my goodness, what a concept. If we can't deliver that in a province as prosperous as ours, then what are we doing? Have you, have you read the book Dignity by a guy named Chris Arnotti? I have not. I have not. It's interesting. I thought you might. I thought you might be riffing off him a bit because this guy is a really interesting guy. He he was a Wall Street dealer, and he started to get taking long walks in Manhattan just to uh, ease the tension. And he started finding himself in neighborhoods that he wasn't supposed to be in, and started hanging around with the people there. And he eventually quit his job and did it full time and doc went around the country to marginalized neighborhoods and marginalized communities and really got to know people and document what they're looking for. And he called his book dignity as the essential thing that they, those people wanted out of life. Uh, and so when you think of dignity, who are you targeting? Are you thinking about are you thinking about communities that have lost their manufacturing base and now have an opioid crisis? Or are you thinking about, yeah, you're nodding your head? Like, no, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I'm actually thinking about most Ontarians, what I believe is most Ontarians. I really do. Um, I think, yes. And, you know, it's interesting. I, when I was running for leader, I, because a federal election campaign kind of landed in the middle of our, of our leadership journey, I, I had the chance to go knock on doors. So obviously I've been knocking on doors in GTA writings most of my political sort of life, 30 plus years. But during the federal campaign, I got out to, I think somewhere around 70 writings across Ontario to literally knock on doors. So not just show up at campaign offices and cut ribbons with the candidates, but actually knock on doors, sometimes with the candidates, sometimes not. And so uh, even though I've traveled as a minister around the province, when you're in neighborhoods knocking on doors, it's a different feeling than when you're just you know, at an announcement or photo op. And it was a real eye opener for me that um, there's in a, in a bad way, 
there's incredible economic diversity in this province. And that's a weird way to phrase it because diversity is a thing we always attach to as a good, and it is a good when we're thinking of, you know, ethnocultural diversity. But there are a lot of people whose situations are dire. And I'm not talking about, you know, only a small segment. When you're knocking on someone's door, when you're standing on their porch, uh, even without being nosy, you can kind of see their world. You can see what's around them. And, what, and when they come to the door, you can see their facial expression. And there's a vibe that comes from them. And I think there's a large chunk of Ontario that is, um, that's fallen behind. And I think we see um, issues relating to economic inequality, an inequality of opportunity uh, that wasn't the case for my parents, wasn't the case when I was born in the early 70s for most people, even though there were struggles back then too. And again, I just, I think we've kind of, we've veered, we've, we've gone a little bit astray in, in how we deal with that stuff. And again, I said this earlier, <clears throat> I think Doug Ford's style of governing in particular um, is a throwback to a, to a period that doesn't exist anymore. All right. Okay. Let's move to some, let's move to some hot button issues and, and see where we land on these things. You mentioned sick days. What should the policy in Ontario be on sick days? During the pandemic, I think there should be a provincially funded um, paid sick day program of up to 10 days. It should be easy to navigate. It should be it should be very accessible. It should be like your paycheck doesn't end, Un unlike the federal program where you've got to apply and it takes time. Uh, so during the pandemic, I think 10 paid sick days is the standard paid for by the province. No more burdens on small business. I think the bigger conversation on the other side of the pandemic, obviously, we produced a two days of paid sick leave when we were last in power. Doug Ford got rid of that. Uh, I think it is a conversation we we need to have. I Part of what's really important to me around the concept of economic dignity is what kind of workplace benefits no longer attach to workers in large chunks of the, uh, the, the, the population and what can we do to give them that kind of floor of support and paid sick days should be part, I think, of that discussion. Right. Well, you know, I mean, you touched on it when you talked about the people you saw when you were door knocking about the dignity theme. And then, um, I mean, there's a real issue now with working poor people, right? right? And especially among the younger generations who aren't getting jobs the way you and I knew jobs. That's Those right. kind of jobs are mu much more rare. And I mean, you can work your ass off these days if you're 25, 30 years old and not be making any money money yeah. and not have any benefits and not have any protections. And, uh, yeah. And you can't afford housing and you, you know, you can't like, there's a whole bunch of, there's a whole long list of things that, um, and look, I'm not saying anybody should be handing anyone anything. Like, don't, don't forget part of the, part of the bargain that my parents experienced was you gotta, you gotta do your part. You gotta want it. You gotta show up. You gotta work. Right. And it's not easy. And you gotta make sacrifices. Like I'm good with all of that, but, but the bargain that used to be at the heart of Ontario's let's say Ontario was, if you do that, if you do your part, you're not falling further and further behind. You're not struggling the way that, you know, people today do have to struggle. And I don't, I think on the current path we're on, it's only going to get worse. And then what, what concerns me most about the, aside from the empathy, I think govern you know, people who are governing should bring to this discussion is income inequality left untouched over time leads to the kind of polarization and therefore the political, um, the political ruptures that we see in different parts of the world and not to be melodramatic, including what we've seen recently south of the border. And I don't know any Ontarian in their right mind who wants to go down that path. Right. Um, you know, it feels to me that as liberals, we've been for a long time. So <clears throat> there was this neoconservative revolution that came along and unwound that bargain that you were talking about, starting with Reagan, in my view, Thatcher, but nonetheless, unwound the bargain that you were talking about. And so it seems to me that for the last couple of decades, liberals have been saying, how can we make poor people better off? How can we expand middle class opportunity without doing anything to dull the edges of the the distribution that cap i mean if capitalism is if the system if the economic system and i'm a capitalist but if the capitalist system is now screwing working people the other side is it is greatly advantaging people of affluence and wealth right now and so 
we have always, we're not class warriors. Liberals don't like to be class warriors, like to be consensus moving forward politicians. But at some point, don't we have to do something about the excesses on the rich side if we're going to do something about the excesses on the poor side? Don't we have to rebalance the power between working people and capital? I mean, the short answer is yes. And I think that over the last 10, 15 years, including some, you know, during the, some of the times that we were in power, I think there were steps that we did take as a government under both Premier McGinty and Premier Wynne that started to move us in that direction. So during the, if I'm remembering correctly, when, when Dalton won his minority in 2011, um, in and around that time, there was a deal struck and uh, there was an extra surtax placed on higher income earners is one example. Um, I think I think the broader conversation that's happening in Ontario, and by the way, look, I'm an optimist by nature and I'm also a capitalist. I even think amongst an increasing number of wealthier Ontarians, there's a realization that the current path we're on is not sustainable for them too. And so as other politicians have said before me, it's the right thing to do. It, it will make for a better and more sustainable, strong economy. It's also in their enlightened self-interest to not let unchecked income inequality go, well, unchecked. And so I think, you know, I believe, I do believe in Ontarians and I have confidence. This, this doesn't mean it's going to be unanimous. Not every single Ontarian who has wealth will want to do more of their share around this and more of the heavy lifting. But I think there's an increasing awareness there. We just need someone who's prepared to have a tough conversation with some of those folks about what needs to be done, again, in their self-interest as well. And I think we can get there without driving wedges, by the way. I think there's a way to do it while maintaining, while maintaining our, our, um, our collaborative spirit and our unity. Okay. I had a, a really hot economist on the show last week named uh, Frances Donald. And among the other interesting, among many interesting things she said to me, she said that she considers childcare to be a piece of infrastructure. She said that uh, people think about buildings and roads when they think about infrastructure, but she doesn't believe that there's a more important piece of e economic infrastructure that we could build than a childcare and early learning system that worked for people. She's right. She's right. And, you know, I will tell you, Ontario Liberals, even though we, you know, we're about to, as you said earlier, embark on our platform development process, we will, I can assure you, we will have something to say about the need for um, that kind of infrastructure. I think the challenge that I have, and I, this is the part of what I've said to the group of volunteers working on this with me, is that um, we have been talking about childcare. You know this as well as I do in this country and in this province for, well, I want to say at least since the early 1990s to my recollection. And I think increasingly there's a bit of um, disbelief amongst the electorate that it's a thing that can be delivered. I think they're wrong. I think it definitely can be delivered. My biggest concern is even if we were to start today, even if there was a premier and a government in place in this moment that said it's a priority, the length of time that it would take to deliver on that infrastructure that the economist you referenced was talking about is a concern to me. So I, and this is what the, the, the direction I gave the team, my team was, we have to be able to chew gum and walk at the same time. So what can we deliver for parents in the short term who have those needs right now, particularly women in the workforce right now, while we're building out the rest of the infrastructure that's required over the next three, five, seven years. Uh, and I think we have to be able to do both. I think we also really quickly, I'll say, need some degree of optionality. I hate to use that term, but if I can within the system, because not every family is the same and not every need is the same. And I think that kind of infrastructure can be it should be agile enough to respond to the different kinds of families that we have and their needs. Awesome. Listen, Stephen, you've been super generous with your time this morning. I want to thank you for coming on. But before we leave, you said you're an optimist, and I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. I'm a pessimist. Um, and um, I'm a glass half full guy. I understand that about myself. So, <clears throat> so that we don't leave everybody on a down note, use your optimism. What is something we should be optimistic about in 2021? I look, I think the most important thing is the vaccines. We, we, they, they came and they were approved, I think, much more quickly than most of us imagined would be the case. We're going to continue to hit some bumps in the road, both nationally and provincially in terms of the rollout. But I think on balance, as we have been told by public health experts, most of the population who wants a vaccination should have it, we hope, by the fall. And so... 
you know, I can see light at the end of the tunnel on COVID. Uh, obviously, lots of work to do on the other side, and and in and between now and then, preparing for the other side. But I'm I'm optimistic that the vaccine is here. It is being sh you know rolled out, and that we are um, we are into the last chapter of dealing with this horrible horrible crisis. Well, thank you. I hope I hope to God you're right. I hope it unfolds that way. And uh, thanks for coming on. Stay safe. Stay healthy. And uh, good luck to you. Thank you so much, David. Great to see you. You stay safe and healthy as well. And I'm sure we'll talk soon. It's been an honor to be on the program. Thank you. Oh, nice to say. Thanks. Let's do it. Okay. Jenny Scott. Tuesday morning. <laughs> Look at this. We're rolling. Oh, yeah. Jenny, how uh -huh. are you? Look at your shirt. I'm doing great. Woo! Flying colors. Look at that. Go Habs, go. And are they going or what? They're flying, man. So they are flying. A player, player of the week for the NHL. But he scored 30 goals. They're fast. I mean, come on. They're skilled. They're going to be a handful for anybody this I, year. I, as I said, if if this is my brand new first time I've worn Carey Price jersey, and if they lose on Thursday night, I will never wear it again this season. Okay. So this is one of the coolest shirts I own, Jenny. This is Montreal Canadiens Fantasy Camp 2000. So old people will remember that there was a guy who played for the Habs in the 70s called Murray Wilson. And Murray Wilson has spent the rest of his life putting together an annual Habs fantasy camp. And my older brother, William, went in 2000. And they hold it up in Tremblant, and you spend, they gather everybody who's anybody in the Habs world. And you spend uh, a week uh, playing golf with them and playing hockey with them and having dinner with them. It's unbelievable. Minus my brother the golf. Got, minus the golf. It sounds amazing. My brother got to center a line between Lafleur and Shut. Wow. I'm speechless. So there you go. Yeah, I know William, and I find it hard to believe. I mean, he's a lovely guy, but I just don't <laughs> think he's got the hands. <laughs> he does not have the hands. <laughs> doesn't have those sweet Pete Mahovlich hands <laughs> hey so listen I you guys I don't know what's going on in the world anymore because it appears that these days if you don't show up for work and if you abuse your staff you can lose a government appointment I didn't know that <laughs> seems unfair <laughs> and certainly this is a rule that has been created since I left politics because it was not <laughs> in force in the no. 1990s when I arrived in Ottawa. No. That is for sure. Julie Payette, how did that happen? Somebody tell me how that, how did that happen? Well, they, they appointed her because she was a celebrity and didn't properly vet her. Although it didn't seem there was, it didn't seem there were like deep, dark secrets. It seemed it was like, pretty well known uh her uh uh personality problem so i think that it was just chosen to be overlooked whether it was her you know uh rumors about her divorce proceeding versus the uh her time at the montreal uh, uh science center it seems that uh, julie payette uh, uh it, it shouldn't have been a shock um as to what we kind of have heard uh, in the allegations, but we don't really know what the allegations are. We are assuming the worst. I actually think it was a stroke of brilliance by the Liberals last week, whether they me it meant it or not. Is So we are in a position where um, Pfizer announces that they're cutting vaccines to every country, um, some by 18%, some by 20%, us by seemingly 75 to 100%, and everyone, all the media are falling over themselves to talk about Julie Payette. A report that hasn't been out yet. I assume this week, when when we have some other bad COVID related news, uh, that, that <laughs> the they're actually going to release the report and we'll find out. You know, when when she threw her shoe down the stairs out of the Stafford, that's what we'll be talking about in like a couple of days. So you think it was deliberate? You're like, we got eight more weeks to go to March, so like, look out, Supreme <laughs> Court justices. One of you is going down each week. I I listen. I. I would like to say I, I I I think it was deliberate, and it makes me think more. Uh, it makes me think more of uh, of the PMO and how they handle issues management. All right, I don't think it was deliberate. Sorry, Dave. So no, I was, I was so I got a machine. My question when I say how did it happen, I have actually got a machinery of government question for you people that have worked in government. You too, 
people who've worked in government. So everybody's talking about this as if the Trudeau saw a photograph of this woman, said, hey, she'd be fantastic, and the staff didn't do any checking or vetting, and they just went ahead and appointed her. My question is, let's assume that all happened that way, what was the PCO doing? So people have talked about, oh, Trudeau dismantled the Harper vetting or recommendation process, recommendation process for Gigi, and that looks like a mistake, at least in retrospect, but wouldn't, isn't it the PCO's job to do things like this? Wouldn't they be investigating the choice for governor general? Wouldn't they be making recommendations, issuing warning signals? Like, it isn't just a group of three people in the PMO that, that are involved in this. No, like, look, uh, and they did. And just because Trudeau scrapped that recommendation panel, whether you think it's a good thing or a bad thing, doesn't mean there wasn't due diligence done. I mean, uh, so I don't think the scenario you talked about is the one that happened. I think due diligence did occur and they uh, they blew it off um, or something happened. I don't know. Did somebody have a warning conversation with her or whatever? But, you know, my favorite part of the story is that according to media reports, it was Chrétien that suggested her, right? But, you know, on the face of it, you go, look, she's a a francophone, a female, a scientist, an astronaut, a hero. She sounds like she's great, but I just, I love, <laughs> so, you know, it's not unusual, like Kretchen suggests her and somebody else, you know, but they still do the due diligence. I like to think that, I like to imagine, though, that, you know, Trudeau's sitting in his office one day and he gets the due diligence report and he calls Kretchen back up and says, hey, I've, I'd just like to get your advice because I've got quite a, quite a hot one here. Like I, you know, they've sent back this due diligence file and they say there's problems. And like, Chrétien is like, well, what kind, you know? And they'd be like, well, you see, she's very abusive to staff. They say that everywhere she's been, like Jenny is saying, you know, and she's at the Science Center in Montreal, she's very abusive to staff. Ah, but the problem, I tell you, I used to hit Hetty with the Soapy Stone sculpture every time he <laughs> say the Stink Society. It was funny. We laugh. He go to the dentist. He come back all better. We have good time. It is no big deal about the problem. What next? You know, and they're like, well, you know, gee, boss, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Kretchen, uh, I got to tell you, they say that... Um, she tried to run her husband down during their divorce, and she got in a car and tried to hit him. She was actually charged with domestic. Didn't, I uh, thought didn't didn't she stab him in the shower? I thought it was she tried to hit him with a truck. No, that know, was like, no. She killed. That was someone else. She hit, hit in the car. Well, that's even less. But you know, yeah. I anyway. I, 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 just, I believe I believe poor Billy Flynn was in the shower one day, and like, she was. Like, <laughs> and she oh, went Jesus. at him with a knife in the shower. Oh, Crutchy would be cool with that. Small on the tear. I hit Donald a many times with the knife. <laughs> hey, smile. We go back to work. There's no problem. Make her GG. I told Romeo, come on, don't kill nobody. Get into the job. <laughs> like, like I, I just, like, I think they, literally, I think that um, they love the optics and the optics look, were great. And, you know, the, I, I think PCO did do the job. I think there's no explanation. There's no chance they didn't raise flags. And I think they blew the flags off or someone said to her, hey, you know, you're not going to stab anybody in the shower. You're not going to, uh, you know, drive people to tears. And she's like, oh, I promise. And, uh, you know, obviously uh, the promise wasn't kept. There was a nice little bit of internal Liberal Party politics for people that were paying attention, uh, which is that Peter Danolo, Mr. Kretchen's former communications director, spent several days in the media pounding the living shit out of the government for their handling of the Payette appointment. And then the PMO leaked that it was Kretchen's idea. Danalolo! The appointment. <laughs> Peter Danalolo. He mentioned my name. Uh, I uh, there's a little yeah, PMO was only going to take PMO was only going to take that for a couple of days. Oh, no, before that was they that was that. a lift the pads and give him a shot in the ribs shot for no, sure. No, but yeah. but LeBlanc Le, Dominic LeBlanc was out basically uh, stepping over Trudeau. Trudeau's initial message going she was fully vetted and this never came up. Dino, um, Dinolo uh, LeBlanc basically <laughs> stepped on that uh, uh, last week when he when he was doing interviews going. The, the the anything from the vetting process should have been better to we basically ignored it. So um, to Scott's point, I, I, regardless of which one it was, um, uh, it doesn't really matter. The fact of the matter is 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 that that's 
uh, the appointment that uh, that's the appointment that this uh, that this government um, this government made. Look, you know, these things are alchemy. I, I can remember when Mikhail Jean was appointed. You know, there was a group of people from the Quebec operation got very excited about her and said, you know, look, we got to run with this woman. And then, you know, PCO did background checks. They did. And people flagged, look, you know, there's some discussion that her husband, Daniel Lafont, may have had, you know, may have been a, he was an artist from Quebec. Guess what? In the 1960s and 70s, he had uh, at at worst, he had uh, uh, separatist uh, uh, tendencies. At best, he was an independentist. And and he didn't even try to deny it, you know, to his credit. He was kind of like, look, you know, that was the milieu that I was in. That was that. Um, but people tried to make that into a big issue. And I spent days over at Rideau Hall with her and with PCO officials working things through. And I will tell you a big difference between her and what we've seen in this last round, you know, and lots of people were critical of her, but to be fair to her, um, you know, what she did not do was insist on an unprofessional, inexperienced uh, deputy to come in. She took one of the most experienced people in Ottawa with, uh, in terms of that role, put that person into place, Mikhail Jean did. And so when the time came for the prorogation crisis, you know, she was, she was like, she went about it. I, I know one of the constitutional scholars that she uh, that she consulted, and he was really impressed. And I mean, and she she made the right decision. I didn't like it as a partisan at the time, but it was indisputably the correct decision. The prime minister should have been granted his prorogation, and uh, and all these suspicions that you know she wouldn't be up to the job confronted with the first and biggest constitutional crisis in in centuries. And she sailed through that thing. And I think that's because she did have the support of a professional operation. And I think if there's a real big sin on the PMO's part, in all honesty, I know I sound like a weenie talking about getting this level of depth, but they should never have permitted her to say that she was going to bring that, um, that De Lorenzo in and make her her deputy. That was a flashing red light and they should never have permitted it to occur. Not that anyone cares. Who are they going to fire next week, Jenny? I'm amazed that they, I'm amazed that she didn't, I'm amazed she didn't want the job very much. Like she didn't like to do the job or anything like that. Because Adrian Clarkson liked her job so much, liked her job so much that in like 2000, around 2002, she started subscribing to the, as we call it in Southwest Saskatchewan, the Little Leader Paper, which is the weekly paper from Leader Saskatchewan, which covers the neighboring town also of Prelate Saskatchewan. And she started in about 2002 subscribing to the leader paper and sending it to me every week, uh, just as a courtesy. <laughs> well, she clearly was that, was, that was the sugar and salt uh, strategy because I got the salt. Uh, she didn't like me. Mad Madame Clarkson was not too kind to me. Uh, she, didn't, uh, she didn't think much of me. She thought I was one of the... Uh, rampaging uh, Philistines coming in to uh, muddy up Rito Hall with uh, my vulgar thoughts and uh, and a scruffy man. That was only but, her. That uh, was only her publicly expressed opinion after she was not reappointed. No, she kept she those thoughts sad. to herself until she wasn't reappointed. Yes, Voltaire's bastard. Yeah, great. <laughs> uh, okay, enough of the GG. Back to COVID. We got to go back to COVID. Mm. Jesus. <laughs> to uh, the vaccine story continues. The daily ups and downs, as uh, Bill Fox was telling me yesterday, it's box score coverage. Every day you add up who got what vaccines, and you either every country either wins or loses the day, um, depending on the day's reports. How is this uh, playing for the Libs so far? Well, I think it's playing fine, but like win or lose the day, I think that we're only Canada's only losing the day. Um, so I, I think that politically it seems to still be going fine because th there's a narrative out there that, you know, there's so much, you know, throwing of mud on the wall that uh, 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 that people haven't realized how far behind we are on, on the delivery date. So the Liberals are still saying that every Canadian that wants a vaccine will be vaccinated by um, will be vaccinated by uh, uh, September, but I don't, from a logistical point of view, see how that's possible, both from the delivery point of view, but most importantly, from the supply point of view. Like, so Pfizer has basically come out and said, Trudeau had his first conversation with the CEO of Pfizer. 
Um, and he is basically, they've come out and said, oh, we'll have our 4 million Pfizer doses. That's Moderna separate, but we'll have our 400, we're, we're 4 million uh, Pfizer doses by, um, uh, by the end of March. But I actually think that's just kicking the can. I, I don't think there's, I think that like, as the weeks go on where it's, I just don't see how it's logistically possible. But you're okay. So just on the substance of it, you're making an assumption, which I think is incorrect and has been proven incorrect already, which is that this is some kind of static situation when it isn't. It's dynamic. You get new platforms will be approved. More drugs will come on. You're going to get shuffling of supply. So I I'm not convinced. I'm, and I'm not saying that um, I'm, I'm not saying that there isn't a huge political threat here. And I'm not saying that, you know, we're we're lapping other countries, um, although I think we're only fifth or sixth when it comes to the G20. So it's not like it's, it, you know, we're at the bottom of the barrel either. But I, I think that we're going to hit a spot. I, I I think the real political jeopardy is sort of now till April, May. I, I, I'm working under the assumption that additional approvals, freeing up a supply, once we hit kind of late March, April, you're going to start seeing many needles into many arms, people of many walks of life and many ages. And that's going to, that's going to obscure that. It's going to feel like it's, it's unfolding. Maybe I'll be wrong and we'll see. Um, but I think, I think the window of jeopardy is between then and now. And so far, this has been a window of jeopardy since the beginning of December. And so far, I think the government has managed to stick handle its way through this with some success, aided by an imprecise focus and sometimes a tonally misfocused response from the opposition. And um, I think now with the House resuming, albeit virtually and so forth, I think it's going to be really, really, really interesting to watch to see what, how does the opposition, in particular O'Toole, how do they concentrate uh, their fire on this issue? Where, like, what's the lever um, that... Um, that unlocks the political vulnerability for Trudeau without seeming like you're cheering failure on this most important and vital public good, right? And I think that's, it's always the balance with, in, for opposition. I think there's a real delicate balance here. And, uh, and I think so far O'Toole has gotten it wrong. I think he's been unfocused on the issue. And I think when he has focused on the issue, he sounded too severe, too damning. And I, I think he's got to find a different register if he's going to actually turn this into a vulnerability for the prime minister and a win for him. I don't think he's been unfocused at all. I think he's been nowhere on the issue, which is part of the which is part of the problem. And so, um, I, you know, Canada is yes, we are we are in the top five percent of G20 countries. Uh, we're also behind Iceland and Ireland and, and other uh, other countries, which I think Canadians would be shocked to think that we are behind. The, the difference is is that they are not having their uh, they are not having the vaccines sh shorted to them like we are going to have in the next uh, in the next several weeks. Uh, it's go it, it, it's gone from we're we're going to get fifty percent uh, is what Pfizer said originally to a hundred percent. We're not getting next week, and I don't think anyone is cheering on. Uh, th this this is the problem with this debate. So I don't think anyone is cheering on not getting the vaccines. I would love for nothing more than Justin Trudeau to succeed at vaccinating everyone as quickly as possible. I would love to give him kudos for that. Um, but the fact of the matter is, it seems that that's not going to happen. Israel is going to have every single one of their uh, uh, every single one of their citizens, 16 and over, uh, vaccinated by uh, the end of March. Why is it that uh, Israel uh, didn't uh, lose any? Uh, was not short. It was we did not have any of their uh, vaccine supply uh, cut off when uh, the European plant, uh, the Pfizer European plant, um, had to halt um, had to halt production. It, is it because BB had seventeen conversations with the CEO of Pfizer and Trudeau had none? And so I think these are questions that I don't think it's it's the opposition wanting failure at all because I think I think everybody wants this vaccine, um, but I think they're legitimate genuine questions, especially considering the liberals seem to be ramping up more and more that uh, they're getting ready for an election campaign. Well, let's set aside the, the, the election campaign. I'll just, I'll add a footnote to that. I, I, of course, there's legitimate questions. I'm making a, I'm making a pure real politic observation, um, which is that when you have something as, uh, like as real as this issue, Right? We're not talking about the GG and, and an advisory panel. We have something as real as this. 
um, how you critique the government and what that reflects on you, not just what you say, but how you have to be mindful of the way in which it will be heard, interpreted, and recycled by others. I think it's it's very, very tricky. It's always tricky for opposition. I just think this thing's going to be super tricky. So I'm not saying there aren't legitimate questions. Of course there are. Um, and I'm not saying there isn't political vulnerability. There is. I'm saying that it's going to take some needle threading uh, to get the critique surfaced without looking... Uh, negative yourself without looking like you're cheering failure. And that's, I, I think that's, uh, it, it's always the trick of opposition. I think it's a, I, I think it is just super elevated in terms of its stakes though, in a situation like this. People talk about calling these, the, the heads of these companies. Now it, it is surely to God, not a matter of calling them and yelling at them or putting a firecracker up their ass. Um, because, uh, this bullshit theater, you know, oh, uh, who called them first and how loud and whatever. Fuck. Come on. I mean, what is, if that's going to be, I mean, I, I love the fact that Doug Ford thought he was talking to somebody important when he was talking to the head of Pfizer Canada. Anybody who's dealt with a multinational knows just how much authority the head of Pfizer Canada has to change vaccine policy. Um, but in any event, um, you, surely must have something to say to these people or offer these people if you don't have a contractual argument to fall back on. I mean, Israel, as I understand it, and others are going to understand this more than I did, uh, Israel made a whole set of agreements with the uh, with Pfizer about testing and test results and about, uh, I mean, they're essentially using Israel as a giant laboratory. I heard something very interesting yesterday that they're saying that the Pfizer vaccine reaches full uh, value, full potency, uh, seven days after the second dose. That's an important thing. That's an important thing to learn, and that's the kind of data that they're getting out of Israel. So that's why they're continuing to do Israel. Um, I don't know. With other countries, is it a question of money? Like, should 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 Trudeau be on the phone offering them more money, or what? What should he be doing? Well, but I think that that ship has already sailed. So the U.S. put vast amount of money, uh, billions of dollars, into. Uh, uh, into uh, the creation of the vaccine and for clinical trials. Mexico, that's the reason they're kind of higher up on the, the list. And we've, we've talked about this before. Um, uh, Mexico, uh, that has no processing capacity, uh, basically said uh, that they would participate in the clinical trials similar to what, um, what Israel has had. So I'm not sure why now this is, these are the conversations that, that Canada is going to have. To me, these are the conversations that countries obviously were having in the summer and early fall months. But this is why I say it's dynamic. That's all fair, um, except for the Israel point, because I think, you know, Israel is such an outlier uh, that I don't think it's actually a useful comparator for any country. Um, and But to me, on the dynamic point, um, that which seems damning right now, which is that um, the government didn't get exactly the right contractual relationship it should have out of Pfizer, um, and it placed too many bats across too many platforms. That may that may, that may be welcome three months from now. Like we may find that when other platforms come in and their production capacity gets upticked, we may find that when we're really rolling in May or something with another supplier, we may say, "Well, we're glad we had that one." So there's kind of two races here. One is what's the race to how quickly you can get started and through people and the other is um you, you know the the race is like when do you finish uh and get to a critical mass and well the, and, the sooner you start the sooner you start the sooner you finish scott well sometimes uh but that may not always be the case and i guess again i'm just that, that, that makes that that makes that makes absolutely no sense what do you the mean you, like the we sooner may you start getting vaccines and start putting needles in people's arms the sooner you finish vaccinating them like but, what all but if it's at a slow but if it's at a slow pace in the month of january and february as compared to a, a much quicker pace in say you know may and june the question is did we, we may find that many countries end effectively uh, immunizing their uh, populations by uh, the end of August or something. As but, a, seems, uh, but they may have they may have actually started, you know, really rolling at different points. Some may have started rolling in December. Some may have started rolling in March. Well, they can roll because they actually have vaccines. The Americans are well over a million uh, uh, a million people a day now. I, I'm just. Again, I'm just saying it's no, no, a dynamic listen. situation. Hey, give me a political guess. Wait, so wait, wait, wait. But wait, give me a political. Give me a political guess here. Give me a political guess here. What does the ratio 
of American vaccinated versus Canadian vaccinated have to be before it's a major political issue here in Canada? Well, now we're at, so we're at what, 1% of the population, or maybe just a little bit under, a little bit up, depending on what the rate was yesterday. And the Americans are at like 7% of the population vaccinated now. And they're, and they're. Yeah, I thought they were three or something times us. Yeah. 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 Uh I just, we've had this discussion and I've said this before. I'm not convinced that this scorecard is necessarily going to be as damning as you guys think. I may be wrong. I, I I mean, it is Uh the most important issue in the world, obviously. It's the most important Uh issue in Canada. I just don't, I'm not sure that Uh people are scorecarding, but they go, oh my God, you know, we're now at six time 600 percent less than the, the united states and therefore i have to get rid of the government i'm not sure it's unfolding that way I in think people's minds, really i i think it's going to get there because uh, and not to get we have we have belabored this and i have been my position on lockdowns and and government ha- handling COVID has been uh, has remained consistent i think uh there are a lot of people that i've spoken to during this now second uh, the second lockdown, the first stay at home order, what, or second stay at home order, um, it's been really tough on people and it's been really tough on their kids. Um, and I think that as you see uh, the, uh, the U.S. Um, uh, continuing uh, to open up, although the U.S. is the U.S. is open. Joe Biden gave his speech on Thursday and said, well, we need a plan because we need to open. OK, well, Joe, the exit out of California, New York, the, the U.S. is open. The economies are are flourishing. Stores are open. Restaurants are opening. All of that kind of stuff. In Florida, you can go to there's locations where you can go to a Publix, which is the local uh, grocery store that you hit every five miles in uh, in the states, and and uh, uh, you can make an appointment to get a vaccine. And so, I think as Canadians see more and more of this, I think their patience is going to. Uh, and as the winter uh, goes on, I think their patience is going to uh, is going to uh, is going to wane. Polling has never shown that, in all honesty, right? I mean, what polling has shown is that people are more freaked out about public health. And, you know, that may be true in the United States. What's also true in the United States is 400,000 plus dead and rolling, right? And I, but, I, I think what you've well, seen... Well, so wait a second. This is a key point. But polling, polling and vaccines, you're, we're talking about COVID. You're not talking about vaccines. No, I was talking about COVID. I mean, indisputable. Scott, I cut you off, but let me throw this in. Let me, okay. I cut you off, but let me throw this into your mix of your run because it's where you're going, which is... How does it change the dynamics in Canadian politics that Trump is gone and that we can expect a more uh, conventional, professional, competent approach to COVID in the United States? So almost nothing was bad in Canada when you compared it to the United States over the last 10 months. So it was almost a freebie for Canadian governments. It feels to me like this is a different dynamic now. I agree. That's a real possibility. I, I Look, I can't defend this. I'm just telling you guys that since this thing began, despite people's thinking that it would switch, generally the public has said, we'll sustain the lockdown measures even as they uh, take a toll on us because we believe that we have to put public health first and we'll reward those governments to send that signal and say that. And I, I have a feeling that this idea that we're going to look and see Biden is vaccinating people quicker than is happening here. And the notion that then people are going to say, well, I've now, I now want to overthrow my government. I just don't think that's going to happen. I just, I, I don't feel that's the measuring tape that people are holding up to the federal political leaders right now. And, I'm, and again, I, maybe I'm wrong, but I just don't think it's happening. Well, let, okay. Think it's let me follow up. Je- I think that, Jenny, let me just throw this. Sorry, go, ahead, go ahead. I was no, going to go say, ahead. okay, well, well what is, what is hurting Ford's numbers now then? I mean, if it's not like, I mean, he is, people are judging him differently than they judged him. And there's a, a huge downward slope in most premiers. And Ford is no mm-hmm. exception. There's pr- approval for handling of COVID. Um, so they've been judged on things that they're failing at. The federal government was judged on things that succeeded at early, like CERB. Why wouldn't it be judged politically on this? People are making other political judgments on the base of COVID. Of course it's going to be. So, so Scott, vaccines right now, there's so much, uh, there is so much information out there uh, and people uh, so desperately want the vaccine. I I know this just with friends and family, like non-political friends and family, they just want to believe. They don't even want to have these conversations about whether the government's failing because they just so want to have a vaccine and they want to go back to 
uh, they want to go back to real life. But we had these conversations in the spring. And I think if if you went back and probably found clips, I, I was saying that this the polling numbers that governments were at in the spring and the summer were an illusion. There were no way that that was really what was going to uh, that, that, that it was going to stay that way because uh, it was just in, it was unsustainable. And so now we're 10 months into this um, February, February 1st. Uh, so we've just had the, the anniversary to the first case that came uh, to Canada that we know of in the last couple of days. February 1st is the day that um, uh, John Tory and just Justin Trudeau uh, went for dim sum and uh, told everyone that uh, calling for uh, the border to China to be closed was uh, was racist. And there was uh, uh, no evidence that uh, COVID was going to spread uh, uh, in high numbers in uh, Canada. I think that's February 1st. Um, and so I think that it was inevitable. I, I don't think there's a shock that uh, political po the politicians like Doug, uh, who went out there and was colloquial um, uh, in uh, uh, in the spring are getting judged now because people know more of what's going on. And so to that point, Scott, uh, Justin Trudeau may be benefiting now from people wanting to have some hope, which is what I think people across the country wanted with provincial leaders back in the spring. Um, and when they're actually going to be judged about where we're at in six months, I think that the polls will, uh, I think the polls will be reflective of that. And I think Canadians will be reflective of that in the next uh, two to three months. I hope Justin Trudeau, I hope, what the liberals are saying is correct. I hope that uh, uh, we get the doses uh, in Canada that what they're saying, uh, but based on the fact that we're sitting at almost February and where we're at in terms of uh, vaccinating people, I don't see it being, being a possibility. Let me give you guys a scenario, okay? And uh, you can, let me give you an analysis and you can dismiss it. Um, and it's, it is indisputably unfair it is indisputably bizarre, um, but I think we're watching it unfold, and I think we've watched it unfold before, and I think it's part of the phenomenon of Justin Trudeau getting measured differently um, over and over and over again. And, and, I, and I, you know, your question, David, about, well, well, how come it's starting to hurt Ford and other provincial premiers, but it doesn't seem to be hurting Trudeau? I think it's... I, I, I said this two weeks ago. I said that I thought that we would see that provincial governments would, if any government's going to pay a penalty, it'll be the provincial governments and not the federal government and not the prime minister. And I, I think that's going to unfold, that I, I think at some level, the, you know, the resonance and the reality of both of my, like I got three kids in this house right now. Like I had a guy from Rogers putting uh, Rogers, uh, what the hell, Ignite in, into our house because Wi-Fi was crashing all the time. I kept him here. Did you have like another kid? Prisoner. I kept him. Yeah, well, well, Will's here, right? Doing online. Oh, okay. Right. And then right. Sam right. and Ben. Right. Jack is away. Right. I mean, I have 32 sons, right? You know, and they all <laughs> want to use uh, my password. Do, 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 you know? um, do, 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 do. But I, I trapped this poor fucker from Rogers in the house. I wouldn't let him leave. I'm like, I want Ignite and I want boxes and I want pods and I want a mesh and I want, I want you to put this like, you know, WandaVision sort of a bubble over my house of internet perfection. And, and I just... People are home with their kids and they're doing online school and it's unbelievably stressful and miserable. And there's a hundred other kinds of pains and problems happening for people with different lives. And that seems to wash up on the shore of the provincial government. I look and I say, God damn it, Lecce and Ford, why aren't you doing something different when it comes to schools? Like that seems to be happening. You thought Whereas, they were doing a great I'll, I'll remind you, you thought that you thought. Okay, the okay, okay. I know, I know. <laughs> Fuck. My point is the <laughs> vaccines thing feels more ephemeral. It's a cloud of different data and, and you know, ups and downs. It Moderna is. said this and that said that. And I just don't think he's paying the penalty. It I don't is. think he's going to pay the penalty. He, I he think is. it's going to hurt the provinces and not hurt Trudeau. And no. yet again, Trudeau is going to not be measured by the same stick that the rest of the political world is. You watch. I'll bet you I anything. I completely, I completely disagree with you. Uh, I think that the polls will catch up. Uh, to uh, who is responsible. It's the reason that the provincial governments uh, are feeling the heat, uh, the heat that they are now. And the province is actually, if I'm the premiers, uh, I'm stopping the love affair with the feds because uh, every day they go out and say, oh, Justin Trudeau's working hard for us and, and he's trying to get vaccines. Well, um, I, I think that ultimately that that's the responsibility for securing vaccines is on, uh, is on the federal government. And I think that uh, 
um, that has to be pointed out a bit more. And I think that it will be pointed out anymore. So I predict that I predict that we're sitting at the last week in January. I predict uh, at our pod uh, uh, at the last week of March, we will be having a much different conversation in terms of uh, where uh, public uh, public sentiment is on the federal government and vaccines. There can only be one, McLeod. So one of us is right and one of us is wrong. And we'll see. By the end of March, I'm with you. Let's have that because I... I understand everything you're saying. I think, I think for it to get, it's fundamentally rational. You're saying I think it's fundamentally for it to get, rational. I, I think, think for it to happen. get really politically potent, for it to get really politically potent, the opposition has to link it to something that's fundamental to Trudeau's approach to government. They have to link it to a personality flaw that people think about indecisiveness or lack of attention to detail or that kind of thing. Or they have to link it to uh, a blindness about China, uh, a willingness to sacrifice Canadian other Canadian interests for the Chinese relationship, something. Because in and of its own, if it's just a story of kind of, of kind of not being as quick on the uptake as others, I don't know if it has the same potency as if you say this horrible situation is an example of a flaw in the Trudeau governing style. So I think the opposition has to somehow find a way to link it to something deeper and more profound. And then they'll have some magic. Yeah, I think that would be great if the opposition did that. <laughs> Do you All know right. anybody hey, in the Conservative what? Party? Could you send a telegram <laughs> or a postcard? A candy gram? Yeah. <laughs> candy gram. Um, okay. Candy Graham. <laughs> uh, here's a lollipop. Do your fucking job. No, I think it'd be great. To, I would love. I would love to see the Conservative Party talk about uh, about um, about that. I saw. I saw them out uh, uh, starting to talk about it yesterday. But but it's the first time that I've really seen any concerted effort talking about vaccines or anything else um, uh, except internal party dynamics for uh, for weeks. So uh, I hope it. Uh, I really really hope it continues. So we have a question, a mailbag question from question. a listener or a viewer. I hope he's a viewer. You know, we go to all this effort for video. I hope he's a viewer. Um, I know. I, do, I put makeup. I put makeup on on Tuesday mornings and everything. I don't. I know. I you you don't. What the hell do no, you? I'm, all right. No. Uh, I assumed you did. In any event. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> it's just natural. <laughs> Matt's, I glow. Matt's question is. Matt's asking us to opine on this point, that if there were to be an election this spring, when there's still a lot of decision-making potential to go on with COVID, when there may still be vaccine-related issues, when there may still be a need for a state of emergency to be declared, when there may still be a need for, uh, when there may still be a need to block uh, Canadians from coming back, uh, whatever you, you may, a big decision like that. His question is, if we're in a writ period, does the government, which is in caretaker mo mode, have the authority to undertake the kind of big decisions and manage COVID the way it might have to be managed uh, this spring? So if there were to be an election in March or April, does that basically remove government for all intents and purposes? I know that there's technically a government, but in terms of acting, does it remove government for five or six weeks? Of course not. The government's still the okay. government. The prime minister is still the prime minister. So um, uh, we've we've seen elections uh, around the world now. Like this isn't this wouldn't be a uh, this wouldn't be an anomaly or even an outlier anymore. If we were to go to an election this spring, it would be uh, um, it would be uh, um, the, the liberals would would absolutely say in government. The two thousand eight financial crisis started in the middle of the two thousand eight election, uh, and Stephen Harper was prime minister and and. Uh, uh, acted as prime minister, went to, uh, uh, I think it was the G20 meeting uh, mid-September, took two days off the campaign to do that. So uh, I don't, I don't think we've, I, I don't think, uh, I don't think that that, that's the, uh, I, I don't think, I don't think that's going to be an issue. I think people could have the argument whether morally they can make the decisions. Uh, uh, but I, but from a government point of view, um, from a government point of view, I don't think it's possible. I also don't think it's possible to go back to your, to your point, David, I don't think it's possible for the Canadian government to uh, ban citizens from uh, from coming back uh, to Canada. We've seen 
Uh, we've seen in Australia, and we talked about it a couple of weeks ago, where they have a limit. It's four to 7,000 people a week. But the difference that uh, Australia and Canada have is they didn't have a prime minister in the 70s and uh, the early 80s who brought in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Uh, and so uh, I, I don't think legally the Canadian government can put a limit or stop Canadians from uh, entering uh, Canada. So there's my answer generally. Scott, over to you. <laughs> um, of course, the government. It, so two things are true. One, technically, of course, the government is and would have to uh, continue to prosecute the issues on vaccine and COVID defense and COVID management, even during a RIP period. Failure to do so would harm it during the RIP period, would harm its electoral uh, circumstances. Um, an over eagerness to do so risk politicizing the issue and, and risk the appearance that you're moving out a caretaker and trying to leverage the crisis to make yourself look good, to take yourself out of a partisan dynamic and make yourself look like you're operating in a, in a leader dynamic um, and a governing dynamic. Um, so those allegations would, would flow. I, I, we haven't had a government trying to operate in the midst of a full-blown crisis um, during an election period, a long, long time. I, I can't remember 2008, the, the financial crisis, 2008. Yeah, it hit toward the end, though, and it was, um, and it um, became it an month, aspect of the debate. But it was the end of September. There was a, there was close to a yeah. month left. Yeah, I guess that's right. It didn't feel, it's it's not comparable to this. It hadn't reached the rhythm that this thing is at, I don't Nothing think. Nothing is um, comparable to this, though. No, that's Nothing right. And that's yeah. and that's my point. And I think and so my fundamental point is, of course, it would go on. You know, yes, it's caretaker government, but it would be a different kind of caretaker government because of the context that's unprecedented. Uh, but I think all of that makes it really tricky. I think it makes it particularly tricky for the government. And I think there's a high risk they would look like they were trying to uh, prostitute the pandemic for their own political benefit. And I think that's a real risk. It's one of the reasons that I think um, you're more likely to see an election in the fall than the spring. I, um, I continue to hold to that. And, you know, it's another issue that Jenny thinks I'm wrong about. But, you know, Jenny doesn't like my shirt. She doesn't think I'm right about vaccines. There's nothing I can do to make her happy. Well, no, but maybe <laughs> I just don't think you're right. In terms of, listen, in terms of the election, I'm actually speaking from, like, take away a partisan hat on this. I'm speaking for if I was sitting right now, like, take away all partisan politics, and I am... Uh, I am Justin Trudeau's an advisor to Justin Trudeau. And um, you've had three provinces in the country have elections, uh, minorities, and two of the minorities went to majorities. Um, you're sitting at high in the polls. If you look at some, uh, like the Nanos numbers, you're sitting at 50% in Ontario, uh, which would actually put you at like John Cretchen, Canadian Alliance, uh, 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 liberal numbers uh when we picked up two seats so depending and so and at the very least you're sitting at 41 percent of the vote in ontario and i use ontario just because um i i know that province a little bit more that's still putting you at the same levels that you had in the last election you've you've increased your popular support in the last year uh, since the election in, in british columbia so mm -hmm. um I, I i'm probably a little conflicted scott by um, uh, when I say you're wrong, because if I'm sitting there as a campaign manager, I'm saying, uh, we just have to figure out how we can have an election because, um, uh, you know, we've seen more and more reports, um, uh, in terms of jobless numbers and what have you, uh, uh, in the U S which will end up gravitating North, uh, that the economic realities of what's happened with COVID over the last year uh, is going to start being felt. And if you look at the uh, the latest, uh, I think it was abacus that came up, um, you see that people uh, are most concerned about health care. So basically, I think, David, you're the pollster, so I'll let you like interrupt me if I'm wrong. But they were asked, other than COVID, what is the top issue? And so p the majority of people said health care, which really means they're talking COVID. So that's so you've got you've got that health care and COVID. Um, but we've now seen jobs and the economy um, uh, surpass things like climate sure. change, for example. Only 20% of people are saying climate change is a priority for them. Whereas if you went back to a year ago, I think in, in different polls, it was anywhere from 45 to 50%. And so I think this is why um, this is why governments, including Trudeau's, is going to want to uh, is going to okay. want to go sooner rather than later. So, can so we David, go back, before we move on, Scott, before no, we move I on, can I just go on. back? I want to ask you something. Yeah, what's that? I want to ask you something. Go ahead. I, 
I, I gave my view on this last week. I think there's a better case to be made, and I think there's more optimism to be banked if you wait and hold for the fall. So I won't repeat all those arguments, but that's my view. Plus, I'm a candy ass, okay? I tend to be uh, risk-averse and scared, and I'm scared of the spring. So that's I would not be the advisor recommending what Jenny's writing. So we would be offering partisan politics taken out of it, but we'd be offering our respective prime ministers different advice. What would you suggest? What would you propose? Where would you come down? <laughs> right now. Right now. Right now. Today. Yeah. I know I can win today. I know I can win today. I have no idea what the situation is in the fall. I know I can win today, and I want to get back to Jenny's point about this, but to just close off on Matt's question, because Jenny opened the door to something interesting to me. Just theoretically, Jenny, in the 2008 election campaign, could you have invested in General Motors? Sorry, sorry, you cut out there. What? Sorry, I, I missed. Could, could, sorry, could in in the in the 2008 it? election campaign, could you have just theoretically, if you'd needed to, if it was that urgent, this is now or never for GM. Oh, could you have invested in General Motors in the writ period? Um. Yeah, I think so. It's a really okay. interesting question. It's I think you could question. have too, I, but boy, I think it's a have. big decision to take when you're in a writ. Yeah, no, I think we, listen, I think if it came down to that, we, we could have. Okay, cool. Interesting. So now to leap forward to what we were just talking about, Scott's, Scott's point asking me, one of the reasons I would go now, and I say this to both of you, and I'm not trying to put Jenny on the spot. I say this to both of you. I have no fucking idea what the conservative offering is right now right. like what is it about Aaron O'Toole that would cause you to consider him as opposed to Trudeau right now like what is it what's the cleavage what's the wedge what's the offering what's the anything if there was a lecture um, right now what would they say it was about <laughs> I actually don't know, to be perfectly to be per perfectly honest. I know what I, I am assuming they are continuing to work on a uh, on a narrative. You've seen uh, Aaron starting to talk about vaccines and uh, what have you. But this is this and this is maybe a discussion for a uh, 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 this is a discussion for a different pod. Um, there's so much talk about um, uh, Aaron and the base and what have you and what they 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 uh, people have forgotten. Uh, the coalitions uh, that Stephen Harper uh, built over the uh, uh, over the uh, elections that he ran, we lost in 2004, and and uh, Patrick Muchard came on the team, uh, and uh, he's one of the most brilliant people that I've ever worked with in in politics, and and he looked at elections from uh, various other places in the world, and we built a coalition. We had you know the names that have been immortalized in conservative uh, in Canadian conservative. Uh, the generation that I'm from, the Zoe's and the Dougies and uh, the Grant and Fiona's and what have you. And so um, I think what the conservatives need to do is they actually need to start thinking what their uh, what their uh, what their voter coalition, uh, uh, what their voter coalition is. I think that a lot of people underestimate and forget about uh, the coalition that Stephen, they always talk about Stephen Harper in the base. Well, um, Stephen Harper did have a base of support, uh, but he also built some electoral coalitions. And this is the problem that I see right now. Uh, this is the problem that I see right now for, for the conservatives. And it's not saying that they can't they can't get there. Aaron's only been leader for, you know, uh, six to seven months. Um, but this would be another argument that I would have, David, if it was sitting and we were sitting in our chairs as campaign manager, if we're purely looking at it, it would be another reason to our point as to why we would go now is we can't give them the opportunity to try to figure out or at least appeal to that coalition, those, the coalition that they're, uh, uh, that they need to build to be able to, uh, win the next uh, election. Harper got 40% of the vote in 2011. Harper got 40% of the vote in 2011. O'Toole couldn't find that with ways right now. 40% of the vote. <laughs> I, I, I hear what you're saying, man. And I guess maybe this is just the, the risk averse aspect of my personality, but I indisputably your opposition uh, is uh, at a weak ebb right now at a low ebb at a, at a weak spot. And that is a huge advantage. Um, 
Uh, but the issue is the issue, and I think the issue is unpredictable in a, in in a six week stretch. I think where we are at on all the arguments I'm making about vaccination, I think if you drop the writ, they get reconstituted. I think suddenly you you invite people to judge you on the basis of your vaccination rollout and whether or not it's urgent enough, in a way that they're not uh, in a non writ period. I I I just. And I, and I have a fundamentally different take than Jenny. I really think there'll be economic optimism if, with good cause come the fall. Like, I think that people will be getting rehired. I think there'll be a critical mass of vaccinations. Economies will be opening back up. We're going to start to see GDP on an annual basis start cranking out in that third and fourth quarter in particular at like 6 7%. And I think governments will get showered with that positivity if they go to the polls end. So, wow. I, uh, I, I, like, I, I would I hold... Like I like the I like the world that uh, that that uh, that you live in. I just don't think it's. I can't fucking wait for September, Jenny. I don't know about you. I can't I, wait for September I, and October. I, 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 it sounds I, I, like it fucking awesome. I know. Well, Jenny won't be here. She's not. The <laughs> ban will still be in effect. She won't be able. She'll be at the Supreme Court arguing that the Constitution permits her the right to come back in the country. Good fucking luck to you. I hope you got a good lawyer. Uh, David and I'll be on a. Uh, we'll be on a patio somewhere in downtown Toronto, uh, living the high life. I listen. No, I'll be I, arguing I your. You I'll be arguing time. your charter case for you. Thank, thank well, you. Well, you're uh, well and truly fucked you. if he's your lawyer. Well, no, listen. I I had a very good uh, Sunday. I went to a restaurant. As I said, it's these places where you can order food and people bring food and drinks to your table, and uh, watch the uh, uh, watch the uh, uh, Green Bay Packers uh, and uh, get monster. Uh, Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, uh, Jenny's dad. I know hard, I'm not a huge. Lines. I'm. I'm. I'll be honest. I. I just enjoyed being out and about. Um. Uh. But yeah. So. Uh. I hope. I, I, Scott. I hope your view of the world. I. I truly hope your view of the world is is, uh, is what happens. But I think that it was what happens. But um. I. I think that ten months into this, we and and looking at other. Uh, economic factors. Uh. In the world and 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 what have you. I think. If if I'm a government, I'm um, uh, for the same reasons I have continue to say I would much rather have the election uh, sooner rather than later, and that's why governments of all political stripes um, uh, are are trying to figure out how to how to do that. Awesome. All right, let's squeeze in a hey you, Scott. You're first. All right, my hey you is um, to Doug Ford, uh, to Justin Trudeau. Um, it's to Stephen Lecce, it's to all the politicians out there, all the political leaders that are out there that, um, whether it's um, a ban on international travel or whether it's uh, the return of school, all those political leaders that feel that it's need uh, necessary at this point to precondition, right? It's necessary to butter me up. Before I bring in the travel ban, I'm going to talk about it gently and warn about it for three, four weeks. Before I tell you that schools are returning, I'm going to talk about whether or not we can do it. I'm going to say a thousand cases. I'm going to muse about it. all this. No more. Okay. I don't need to be buttered up. Fucking fry me. Okay. Politicians. Okay. Political <laughs> leaders. I do not want to be preconditioned. Just tell me when the decisions are coming. Tell me what they're going to be. None more. No more hints. No more drop breadcrumbs. I'm out of that territory. I want to know, nope, we're not going back until the end of March with school. That's the way it is. So strap down and get yourself sorted. Or yes, we may go back on the 10th of February. This is what the conditions would need to be. Same thing on travel. Make a decision. Be clear. Quit hinting and teasing and tearing off veils. I don't like it anymore. We're a year into this thing. Tell me the shit, man. Tell me the shit. Oh, uh, fuck, Scott. You took my head, you. <laughs> oh, <did I? laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, all right. Well, my hey you then. I'm I'm going to specifically do it to my party, uh, uh, the Ontario party. Um, uh, Doug, hey you. Um, uh, Justin Trudeau is trying to figure out how he can have an election and not get get uh, pillared for the fact that two of the largest provinces in the country are at stay at home or lockdown orders. Uh, he is not your friend. Uh, Christian Freeland is not your friend. Um, stop giving them a pass on the lack of supply of, uh, of vaccines because I guarantee you uh, for uh, some of the uh, uh, for some of the issues that provincial governments have had and we have talked about those at nauseum and we can talk about them more like the travesty that is long-term 
uh, long-term care in Ontario, uh, Justin Trudeau is not going to give you a pass. So that's my hey you tip this week. Because Scott All right. mine. My, <laughs> <laughs> my no hey, guilt. My hey you. My hey you is to Premier Horgan out in British Columbia. I'm tired of having you thrown back in my face whenever I criticize conservatives for not having done anything about paid sick days or not having done anything about long-term care. People say, well, look, BC has an NDP government and they haven't done it either. So you're a new Democrat. You're supposed to believe in government. Stand up and do something impressive about long-term care homes so that I can go back to criticizing conservatives for their ideological uh, <laughs> resistance to doing the right thing. <laughs> Good stuff. All right. Listen, thank you, you guys. This was fun this week. Thank everybody for listening or watching. And uh, I want to thank our presenting sponsor, TELUS, as well as, of course, the entire Air Quotes media team behind this. Give us a shout out on social media or go to iTunes and give us a rating. Get the word out about the show. Thank you all for listening and thank you for your support. And we will see you in one week back with these fine people. Go Habs, go. Toodles. Go Habs, go. Oh, wow.